Hey film friends, I'm Nick Furman. This is Furman on Film. Welcome to the channel. Okay, wow, guys, rather than a brand new original film, a popular 80s blockbuster is back again 36 years later with a sequel. I feel like this never happens. It's the return of Tim Burton with his patented dark humor and quirky visual aesthetic, and Michael Keaton back in the iconic role as the mischievous bio-exorcist. This time, the film ratchets up the craziness with dozens of new characters and more storylines than we know what to do with. And a ghost, ghostly boyfriend. Okay, so that's one. Winona Ryder getting basically cucked by Justin Thoreau. Beetlejuice's ex chasing him to the death. A random side plot of Willem Dafoe. And you've got all the shrunken head bobs. I mean, there's it just keeps going and going. But does it live up to the original? More importantly, does it justify its own existence? Step into the afterlife. Let's take a look and see. This is Tim Burton's Beetlejuice Beetlejuice. <laughs> Well guys, we're gonna do something a little different today. We're gonna switch it up. I'm gonna give you all the dislikes first, then we'll get to all the film's pros. And you'll see why in just a minute. For starters, let me just say, there's kind of a lot of them. But in order to explain that, we've gotta take a little look under the hood. So the original Beetlejuice just drops in audiences laps in 1988 like a bomb. It was this newcomer named Tim Burton's second flick after Pee Wee's Great Adventure. And it had crazy ghoulish costumes and visual gags for days. This dude took the macabre and made it amusing. Then he grabbed a funny man who had been bouncing around 80s flicks and stuck him in the titular role as a bio-exorcist, essentially a demon. Burton smartly got Winona Ryder, the gothic Gen X wonder kid, to sign on as well. The rest of the cast was filled in by stalwarts like Catherine O'Hara, Alec Baldwin, and Gina Davis. And then he just let them all loose in this harebrained story about hauntings and the afterlife and shrunken heads and town models. What I'm saying is it's hard to overestimate how major league the original film was to a generation of kids like me. And here's where it gets interesting for the sequel. Burton and his pals knew it too. Because after 88, tons of ideas were kicked around for a Beetlejuice sequel. Some of them even got write-ups. There was a Beetlejuice in Hawaii. Aloha! A Beetlejuice in Love, Beetlejuice at the Eiffel Tower. The studios and script doctors were just kicking stuff around, but nothing ever got made until now. So why is this informative? What does any of that have to do with Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice as we've received it? Well guys, here's the long and the short of it. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice has approximately 517 plot lines. Oh, it sounds like I'm kidding, but please, just start counting them as you watch. The Monica Bellucci storyline is entirely pointless because he always puts the girls he's dating in his movies, so. It acts like it's building to something, but then it ends up fizzling out completely. The Willem Dafoe plot, by contrast, is non-existent. It's a joke about the industry and actors which just plays on repeat. It's amusing and his skull-bearing practical effect head is cool to look at. We think it's gonna tie into the ending, but again, uh-uh. Here's a film that somehow seems like it took all of the former ideas of Beetlejuice in love and traveling the world and tried to shove it into the same film. The result is a flick that gets super zany, but is just entirely overstuffed. It's not even that long, but there is not nearly enough editing here. Too many ideas on screen and hardly a one of them really executed well. There are so many pieces it would be impossible to bring it all together. They more so just careen off of each other into some sort of Burton dark magic. Beyond this, I'll just mention one other complaint. Remember Lydia, guys? Remember Winona Ryder right on the eve of Heathers? That girl was a badass who spoke truth to power and was pretty staunchly anti-authoritarian. Yet, here we have her, a complete shell of herself as the mother with an estranged daughter who's getting completely jerked around by the incredibly toolless Justin Thoreau. See, this is the legacy sequel problem. We want to bring a new generation of people into the franchise, so we need some family drama. Enter crappy parents works every time. But I just felt like where this one went was just not who the Lydia character of the original really was. And enough with all the damn bobs too. So here we are. You're thinking, how could you possibly recommend this film after you just completely flayed the plot and story? Well again, I'll give you the one line answer. Keaton is awesome and the film is so fun and funny, who cares if it doesn't all make sense? Wow, what happened to you, man? Thought you were a critic. 
Look, every time Michael Keaton enters the frame, this movie comes to life. He's aged, sure, but he's still fully committed to the role and brings plenty of laughs. Likewise, Catherine O'Hara is going for it in this role. I think the practical effects and costumes this time around are somehow even more charming, and there are even more morbidly delightful moments of hilarity here. I said the Bellucci plot is terrible, and it is, but the way her character first appears is an awesome assembly sequence. We all know that Jeffrey Jones is too much of a dirt bag in real life to come anywhere near this film, but the way they show his demise and claymation, and then the running sight gag of a man severed at the torso, so you never have to see his face, is extremely clever. I think people's mileage may vary on Jenna Ortega and the whole lovey boyfriend side plot, but I gotta be honest, I kinda bought the stakes of it. It gave us a real need to have that Beatle dude appear. In classic Burton fashion, there's this black and white sequence which pays homage to Italian giallo. You're starting to get the picture, I think. You know, when you're a kid, sometimes you play on the playground on a little merry-go-round and someone starts to spin you. Slow at first and then faster and faster until everything is a blur. That's kind of the third act of this movie. When I watched it, I found myself breaking it down and going, this plot line doesn't connect and that goes nowhere. But when you just let the sheer goofiness of it wash over you, it's a great time. And that led me back to the original, where I realized that one completely goes off the rails too. That's part of what makes it such a unique and terrific picture. So that's my take. Beetlejuice was a film that was special, but its legacy sequel is one that is a whole lot of fun in all caps. And that's not such a bad thing after all. So what do we conclude? Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice may be overstuffed with ideas, but it's still an absolute blast. While the plot feels a bit tangled and some character arcs fall flat, Michael Keaton's electric return as Beetlejuice and Tim Burton's playful gothic flair keep things as lively as ever. The practical effects and dark humor are just as charming this time around, delivering a madcap ride that embraces its own chaos. Sure, it might not all make sense, but it's irresistibly fun, and in the end, that's what counts the most. Well, there you have it. The only thing left to discuss is our rating for this picture. FOF gives Beetlejuice Beetlejuice 3 out of 5 stars. If you enjoyed this review, please let us know by giving us a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. Also, don't forget to visit FermanOnFilm.com for even more movie content. Thanks for watching. I'm Nick Furman. This is Furman on Film. Stay firm, my friends.